was once Atlantean, and oh what a time it was. A mess of a time. Power Girl is a character with a bit of a complicated history, although it has been rendered more convoluted at times than it needs to be over at DC Comics. One interesting moment that is often mentioned as a blip is Power Girl's history being Atlantean. How did this happen and why, and is it indeed as messy as some claim? The answer is yes. I'm Sasha, this is Casually Comics, and let's hone in on this period, because I want to talk about Power Girl, and it's been too long, and it got way more awkward than I thought it would when I first started scripting, but we're in it now. Now we did a mega overview of Power Girl's history a few years back, but today as mentioned I want to focus in on this era, because it starts off one way and then veers very strongly into a different direction that even contradicts how it started. Power Girl debuted in All Star Comics number 58 in 1976. She was created by Jerry Conway, Rick Estrada, and Wally Wood. She started off on Earth 2 and was Superman's cousin. So essentially an alternate Supergirl, although there were differences, such as her being older, having a different, more confident personality, and being more boobastic, or well endowed if you want to use a real word. I don't. Boobastic. All was fairly uncomplicated, or as uncomplicated as a situation with multiple Earths can be. That is until 1985 and Crisis on Infinite Earths, which would collapse the multiverse into one remaining Earth. And yet Power Girl would be folded into the remaining DC timeline. All of this would leave the character in an interesting position. She couldn't just be the Supergirl of that Earth, because Supergirl had died in crisis and they'd made a big deal about it. Part of the rationale for killing Supergirl had been that Superman was going to be the last Kryptonian once more, and so we can't have more running around. So Power Girl, Kara, was going to need a new backstory. They're keeping the name. They addressed this very quickly, as there were several characters who had their histories re-explained in the wake of DC's first crisis. Power Girl's turn came in Secret Origins number 11 from the year 1986, in a shared issue with Hawkman two confusing origins for the price of one. Her story was written by Paul Cooperberg, with art by Mary Wilshire, and colors by Carl Gafford. We start off seeing that Power Girl is still operating as such. Power Girl is having an existential crisis, in that at the start of this, she remembers the past Earth now gone, her life, her family, and now she is adrift in a world that doesn't remember her. We get a flashback of her parents, Krypton, the explosion, traveling through space in the symbio ship. They specifically highlight for 60 years, aging slowly, with the symbio ship providing an artificial reality around me, a dream world to keep me going through the long journey. A journey during which I aged only 20 years. Next thing I knew I was landing here on Earth. Well not here exactly on this Earth, but a one a hell of a lot like it. Complete with my cousin, Cal, now a middle-aged hero the world knew as Superman. Except now that Earth doesn't exist anymore. Neither does that entire universe, or my past or even Cal. She goes on about the crisis, the fusion of the worlds, and how confused she is to have awoken and found herself still there. And nobody else has gotten around to question just where this Power Girl person comes from anyway. Enough to make a person doubt her sanity, huh? Unless somehow a small piece of that non-existent past survived. A symbio ship. The closest thing I've got left to a home. It's really dark. She's to the point where she's thinking about ending things. Also, they're using the symbio ship again, time of recording in the 2020s. As for back in the 80s, her ship suddenly alights with a mysterious energy, and she finds herself trapped, speaking with a figure she doesn't recognize, but who addresses her as granddaughter. He hits her with a magic spell and some flashbacks. Uh, you do not really remember your old grandfather, do you, little Kara? But there was no reason why you might, for has it not been 45,000 years since last we met? In a faraway world that exists now only in legend and myth, ancient Atlantis. Does this tug at your memory, Kara? No, I thought not. But let me go on. For several pages. He tells over time when Atlantis reigned, and yet magic was dying. The era of science was dawning. You're a wizard, Kara. No, that's not the way it goes. Not right now. You're descended from wizards, Kara, for now. This is Arian, who debuted in the 80s in Warlord 55, where he was the backup. And he was created by Paul Cooperberg and Jan Dursima. So Cooperberg is working here with characters he's familiar with and likes. There's a fondness just running through this for Arian. Lord High Mage of Atlantis. Arian is definitely born of the swords and sorcery boom of the 80s. He had his own series. Arian, Lord of Atlantis. It's just fun to say. It lasted 35 issues and began in 1982. Finishing off with, you guessed it, Crisis on Infinite Earths. So a lot of this part of Secret Origins is Arian's history and catch up there, such as the fall of Atlantis being caused by former Atlanteans who had left to go to space and then return millennia later changed. Kara, as a baby, is captured by Garn Danuth, Arian's evil brother, who uses her as a vessel to house his soul because he's trapped in the dark world. And there's just a casual mention of the fact that Arian modified her genetic makeup in some way. It's kind of vague, but sounds super questionable on Arian's part and is going to become so later on. Followed by a sunburst of pure joy, for here was this child of your daughter, and you had so obligingly conducted your experiments.
genes and genetics, making her receptive to both my essence and the power of Dark World where the magic still lives. But I made only the smallest genetic manipulations, nothing that could have harmed her. That's what they all say. How tested is this magic slash science? So in order to save Kara and stop his brother from opening up a dimensional rift between Earth and the Dark World, he gets a crystal which houses the soul of their father. Kara ends up placed in the crystal and sent off and he goes into some trapped in combat with my brother mode. It's not entirely clear. There are some details left kind of floating in a way that may be intentional for a mystery later on or in a way that could be we just don't have answers but let's fill in what we can. Here's what we got. But the crystal was gone and so was Arian. You did this time and place. Myself, well, I do wonder that. You see it now, do you not? Krypton, the symbio ship were not but illusion, suggestion, magic. A bit of my own self went with you, my child, to guide and help shape your future. Your true origins would have been too difficult to accept in this new magicless age. So whilst you did rest in a dimension beyond time and space, aging but two decades in the passing of 4,500. So he goes on to say that he probed reality and found a suitable alias and identity for her. And that was a Superman's cousin. And the genetic modifications he'd done to her would match that she could have powers like his. And so it all worked out. And then he just waited until it was time to send her out, which is supposedly after the crisis occurred. It seems, they don't specify. We're just trying to find a way to make her being here still make sense. And so the problem was convolutedly solved and Kara is left very confused. The ship is turned back into a crystal and this Aryan, which is just a fragment of his true self, which was left behind, he must go. His planet or dimension or somewhere needs him. But I must go, for there is no room in this era for the memory of a faded old mage. Remember me, precious child. Even though there's probably just a way to get him out of the way of the story and not have to deal with it, it could also be a bit of a commentary on the fading of popularity of just that swords and sorcery genre, and if so, it's a little sad. His energy, that crystal essence, is sucked into her belt, and she goes on to declare that she's a real orphan now. I was still an orphan, but a real one now. I mean, with a past and a family. Roots. I'd been lost without that, but I'd found my way again, and it felt good real good. I will give them this. It's creative. A very inventive solution to a problem they 100% caused themselves it is interesting. And there are things that you could do with it. There are some little areas to play it. The thing is, this didn't really seem to solve the, well, what do we do with Power Girl Dilemma? And it doesn't seem like many people were too, too into it because it doesn't get mined for a bit. For the most part, she was kept close to what she was doing before, such as being placed on iterations of the Justice League. Some things that happened to Supergirl would be applied to her, like she gets a cat, which is named Stinky instead of streaky. But as mentioned, not much was done with the fact that she was Atlantean. The most work that was done with it was by the infamous Gerard Jones during his tenure on Justice League Europe, where it becomes an important part of her character and central to the arcs she goes through. Her costume was changed in Justice League Europe issue 37 in 1992, which sees the return of the boob window, but now it's cut out like a diamond. There's an explanation given for it aligning with her Atlantean origins, but that doesn't come until issue 40, alongside an odd plot. That issue is entitled Hal's Back, and that's gonna matter for her plot. And also I just wanted to say that because they look so happy about it, except for some people in the back. Here's how she explains her costume. I'm finished with that now. That's why I designed this new costume to reflect my Royal Atlantean heritage, to continue the colors of the house of Arian, my grandfather, to assert myself as a woman of power. If you want to know what she's finished with, it's men and the patriarchy who's keeping her down through diet soda and other things, but diet soda. There was a subplot that was going on before this about how she'd been acting irrationally. And so Dr. Light went to check with a specialist who deals with superheroes and behavioral issues for when specifically female superheroes are acting up. Yes, it's exactly how it sounds. It's meant to be funny. Your miles will vary. Because the cause of these behavioral issues specific to female superheroes was diet soda. You mean by drinking diet sodas, I, I should have known men. What? I'm trying to keep my body trim and fatless, trying to live up to some male ideal of the female body. I've been making myself insane. Oh now, please do not blame the poor little men for this. After all, the sensual power is a female power. And how can we speak of tyranny when women are the masters and men the slaves? Garbage. <laughs> I'm sorry, the accent was written that way. We have to go over the top French. To les femmes en français. Male wars destroyed the Atlantis of my birth. Male magicians kept me in suspended animation for centuries, implanted false memories in me, making me think I was just a pale imitation of a male hero, Superman. These issues are strange and jarring if you just came off of reading the origin issues because there's been enough distance and they don't refer back to those original issues with an editor's 
note that one could just take this at face value, but if one looks at that issue in this, you will see that it is playing in some of the gaps that were left, but it's radically changing the context, what was going on there. That was not why she was placed in suspended animation. It was different than that. They are going to elaborate on this thread, but in the process, they are just going to use the character in the same way that she is railing against in this scene. Now they had already begun this journey of angry power girl and making Arian more of a jerk, kind of changing what we were doing in Secret Origin. Kupenberg went into more details surrounding Arian in this era, about him coming forward in time after battling his brother, and this happened in Arian the Immortal miniseries in 1992. And then they expand a bit upon him again in Justice League Quarterly 13 in 1993. But this was presented as Arian was selfish, not sexist. But I guess you could argue that if you wanted to. It's not quite clear why they did this. Perhaps just drama, perhaps just trying to fill in some of the gaps, play around with the base. It ended up going in some wild directions though. Also, Power Girl isn't Supergirl. She doesn't live in Superman's shadow the same way that Supergirl does. She doesn't spend years hiding in an orphanage. She isn't his secret weapon. In fact, over on Earth 2, she very quickly rejects even having a symbol remotely like his because she wants to be her own woman. And that happened in the pre-crisis timeline, which is where the memories that are implanted in her are said to be from. I could go down a rabbit hole there, but. I'm not going to. In general, this era is pretty memory hold. They've started to be more collected and so it's a bit easier to track. Some of the memory holding came because of the author's conviction in 2018, with it first really breaking in 2016. And some of it was already happening beforehand, just because this isn't a much beloved era of the Justice League or for Power Girl or for many of the characters involved. Even though now you're starting to see more collections because Zero Hour is coming back into vogue and they're completing the JLI. It's an era that does have its moments, but Power Girl's plots aren't really one of them. The other Atlantean link is gonna come from Power Girl's relationship and romances, starting off first with Aquaman, who she bonds with because of that shared connection with Poseidonus and their heritage. She bonds with him the most intensely in issue 46, under the sea, but he regrets it in the next issue. I just wanna read this whole page because it's so melodramatic and it stays with me. I'm sorry, Carrie, I'm sorry, but I can't do this. It doesn't matter how beautiful a moment we had together. I can't be with another woman, especially not a fellow member of the League, as long as I'm haunted by the memory of my wife. But Arthur, the past is the past. If you rely on memories to know who you are, then you can never change. You can never grow. Believe me, Arthur, I know. For so long, I believed I was Superman's cousin. That was my identity. Then I learned those memories were false. And now that Superman has died, I, I, I lost everything to that past, to that me. But I'm still here. I'm going to go on living as someone new. You have to do the same, Arthur. Don't you see? We need each other. No, I can't need anyone. We're teammates, Kara. That's all we came here to prepare for a junket to Russia. And our preliminary work is done. I have to get ready to go. It's fine. She bounces back and she's having a fling with Hal in issue 50. It's an adrenaline fueled mid fight type thing. Underneath his construct in the middle of the battle. What concentration, what will, and Hal doesn't even know what will is. It's been years, it's still funny. To me at least, maybe to you it's not funny anymore. Now we need to go into the next big plot from this era that turned out to be Atlantean even though it didn't seem that way at the start. And that's Power Girl's pregnancy, which at first seems like Hal thinks it's his for obvious reasons. He's super awkward about it though because he also knows about her and Arthur's kind of sort of thing, maybe. We got pretty hot and heavy there for a minute until you stopped it because you said you won't do that with a man unless you've got a real relationship. Well, it never seemed to me that you and Aquaman had a real. Anyway, she punches him so hard the background vanishes. That's assault and he doesn't have to take it. What did you do that for? Because I didn't like what you were about to imply. What do you expect, Kara? You want me to believe this is an, an immaculate conception? Believe what you want. I have no other answer. This is from Justice League International 56 from 1994. And we'll will never not amuse me that the story goes out of the way to make you question whether or not her and Hal slept together or present that as the odd option compared to immaculate conception. No, her and Hal not being careful and being irresponsible, that's the outlier choice. The truth is that her grandfather, Arian, did something magical to ensure that she was impregnated. I hate it. I wish it was Hal. So many sources just gloss over it with, she had a mystical pregnancy. No, add on as induced by grandfather and then add on but why though? The thing is, as we're gonna see, they don't even ever give a really compelling narrative reason for it, so at least it could have all kinds of grounding, no. This baby would go on to become a hero, Equinox, and very quickly be shepherded out of the plot, into the nether sphere of plots we don't talk about until maybe we can find an explanation for it, or maybe just no one wants to touch it again. We'll see, time of recording. Now as for the explanation is, we're looking at Justice League America, not of America, just America, the of is dropped, from 1994, and we're looking at issues 93 and 94. Now the backstory about what was going on 
Atlantis is shifted. And it's presented as Kara being sent off as a crucial figure in their magical war as the time of magic faded. That she was destined to give birth to some kind of powerful figure, and her grandfather had to ensure that that would happen, even though it doesn't seem that he's clear exactly of what would happen. He just knew he had to do something and involved impregnating her. And it's all super loose. You did something magical to create this baby inside me. But why? You'd think an old mage would know that, wouldn't you? But we mages deal a lot in prophecies and signs. The war between dark and light is coming to a head and somehow the mystic great grandson of Arian is the key. How could you do this to me? You're my own family. How could you do it? Do what, Kara? Give me this baby. I'm so uncomfortable. It doesn't even sound like they're talking about it in the context of what's happening. Also, Arian's young again. We should have just done this plot with Hal. It still would have been a huge betrayal of Kara and a retcon of this new history they'd given her, but it would have been less awkward than this. Plus, then you would have had the tragedy of Hal now being the villain Parallax, since Zero Hour was happening at the time. The plot could have worked. Atlantean Kara didn't have to culminate in this, because this is the rest of the Atlantean plot. The baby is incredibly powerful, and seeing him threatened, the power of motherhood, it triggers Kara's long dormant secret Atlantean magical powers, and she uses them, defeats the villain, Scarabus, and then they're gone, seemingly for good, but they come back later. There are things to be learned about you too, Kara, the power you tapped into. I don't know where it came from, Grandpa. I don't know where it's gone. I just hope it comes back. And she's keeping the baby, and she's decided that she's A-OK -okay with what went on. I'm not A-OK -okay with what went on. Her baby is hyper-aging and eventually runs away, and she is chasing him down, and we once more get to see her power as an explanation for everything, kinda. And guess what? It gets worse. We see this in an encounter with Scarabus. This is from JLA 107. Baby, I won't let him hurt you. Oh, your grandfather, Arian, and his mages want to combine the power of light and darkness to create their ultimate champion. So they took the body of a good little girl and mystically impregnated it with the stolen genetic material of a bad big boy. Now step aside, dear. And let me kill our son. Uncomfortable little good girl, big bad boy phrasing aside. From a narrative perspective, this means that her grandfather artificially impregnated her with the essence of their greatest enemy who's a demon thing. Her son gets us out of this problem by hyperaging to a man, becoming Equinox, taking out Scarabus, and then leaving to do other things and telling his mom that it's time for her to do her own thing. Her motherhood is done. Bye bye. Your life is your own now. My life has never been my own. I don't even know what that means. Learn then. Wake up, mother. Son, please. You don't condescend to your mother that way, young man. You go to your room. But he can't, because he pieced out of continuity. Time of recording. This is the most that is done with her Atlantean heritage. While they still use her going forward up to Infinite Crisis, she's more utilized in a classic Power Girl type way. During her time on the JSA, specifically issue 50, they begin retconning Arian, now saying he wasn't her grandfather and had been protecting her. We're trying to start to undo some stuff. And 2005's Infinite Crisis retcons this retcon as it reintroduces the multi re-establishing her original origin as her true one. She's a core component in this series. Her remaining on this earth is now positioned as a key component in Alexander Luthor's plan to recreate the multiverse. And so the Atlantean era was left behind. It was a time. Again, the base concept at start is an interesting way to work her into canon. Trying to tie her to a different established part of DC lore and also bring that forward wasn't a bad idea. It's what ends up being done with it that isn't stellar. It's not utilized a lot, and what is pulled from the gaps where the details were left to be filled in are filled in a way that while there are some interesting points, a lot of them end up being very creepy. The idea of her being a crucial component in ancient war, that's interesting. Grandfather impregnating her with magic baby, not so much. Thing is, as mentioned, it didn't have to be this way. There was a way to write this and make this humanizing and tragic and also not make Arian so sketchy. Starting off, just take that off the table. No magical grandfather impregnation with their demon enemy. No, these are all just my ideas. Of course, you could leave it that way. Just off the top of my head, we're brainstorming. Let's switch it up so that Arian's brother's plan all along was to gain control of her, and he knew that her spawn would be a powerful magic user, and he wanted to use her as a bridge between dimensions. He was planning to play the long game. He was going to kidnap this baby, raise her, and then eventually they would have this magical bridge baby somehow. And then that would also explain how she would meet the person she had to have the baby with in the dark world. 
because he's already there and he would bring her there. Okay, now we move to Arian, tries to stop this and ends up sending her forward in time. And this ends up delaying the inevitable. All that's left is the vestigial image on the crystal. So it can't fully explain why she's in the future and the dangers of if she has a baby. Now she ends up getting pregnant with Hal's baby. She decides to keep it. She's already emotionally vulnerable because Hal goes insane, becomes parallax, and now she's left with this baby. We can even give the baby some magical powers off the bat. We can question whether it's somehow Hal's ring, transferring it down, if it's her own stuff in Atlantean, we could do a little plot around that if we wanted to. We can get really out there and name the baby because she never names him, just calls him baby the entire time. But somehow the baby's hyper aging and now Scarabus can appear and kidnap him. You can then link Scarabus to Garn. Maybe we could do some classic swords and sorcery stuff. Like he knew that he was supposed to be betrothed to her. They have a big climactic battle. Maybe the baby can age up to Equinox and then back down. We'll figure out the baby. But that's just me thinking about off the top of my head. What do you think? Does that sound like it could have gone a bit better? We could have kept most of the bare bones of what was going on there, but it's less squeaky. If I had more time and inclination, maybe we could cook a bit more, but what do you think? What are your ideas? As it stands, this was not the strongest period in Power Girls history. It is interesting and she retains her core personality characterization, so there is that. But it's also a mess with plots that are at times downright disrespectful to her character. They're emotionally unstabilizing diet soda. I just want to discuss this because so often it's just a single sentence of she was Atlantean, but the madness, the sheer madness, I just need to talk about with somebody. Atlantean Power Girl was an experience. Not my favorite favorite Power Girl era, but those are just my thoughts and I want to hear yours. Do you disagree? Did you like this direction for Power Girl? Do you wish they had stuck with her being more separate from Superman? What is your favorite Power Girl era? Share your thoughts down below while you're down there. Please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, or I said share, but do it again. <laughs> Hit that bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.